In our last couple of videos, we've been looking at South Park, and in our last video, we, we saw the vision that three men had, William Jinks and, uh, of course, the Moat brothers, uh, uh, Eugene and Edward. We don't have any really uh, pictures, real good pictures of the Moat brothers, but we do have this one here that shows uh, Eugene Moak and his family outside their home. The home was located at 32nd and Moak Street, and the photograph uh, was taken about 1905. And looking left to right are Mrs. Minnie uh, Moak, uh, Lillian Moak Lasher, uh, that's the one that's on horseback, Elmer on the bicycle, baby Eugene, and then Eugene Moak Sr. The woman holding the baby wasn't identified. Perhaps she was the nanny or perhaps even a relative holding the baby. The Moat brothers became pillars of Port Huron's business community. Their enterprises included Moat Machine and Foundry Company, uh, which you see is the logo here. And then in 1918, they became the Moat Machine and Tool Company. And you can see the difference uh, in their advertisement on uh, this piece of ad here. They sold all types of things, as you can see from this ad, uh, but mainly they sold the uh, tools, uh, power tools for, for industry, uh, word turning lathes and uh, saws and saw tables, band saws and so forth. And uh, if you look carefully, uh, some of these are still around today. Now here's an ad for uh, an industrial shaper, and here is one of the same moat shapers uh, today. Uh, they're still around, like I said. And if you look carefully, you can still see the uh, Moak uh, logo uh, right on the tool. And in this ad, uh, along with other tools, you'll see a bandsaw, a Moak bandsaw. And today, there's a proud collector here that has that uh, bandsaw, a bandsaw similar to that anyway. And uh, it's in pretty good shape, it looks like. They made an excellent tool. The Moaks actually ran a foundry and a machine shop. Part of the complex was designated for the foundry and the other part the machine shop. Prior to making uh, power tools, uh, especially during World War I, they had a contract with the government to make the nose part of artillery shells. The Moak complex was located on Connor Street, very close uh, to the downtown area. And you can see it inside uh, this red uh, rectangle on this aerial shot of South Park. That's Electric Avenue going horizontally and 24th Street going off to the right and then straight up to the rectangle would be Connor Street. In this old photograph we're looking at uh, North Boulevard and as you uh, look behind these houses you can see the very unique uh, frontage of the uh, Moke Machine Shop there. It had that stair step front. Quite recognizable. I'm not sure when this picture was taken, but uh, it was taken much later, obviously. Uh, you can see the vehicles there. But these are employees of uh, the Moat Company. And can you tell what's uh, loaded on this flatbed trailer behind them? Well, let's look at this picture and see if you can tell. Any ideas yet? This picture was taken right after they loaded the shipment of manhole castings on the truck. Today, if you drive down Connor Street, you'll still see some evidence of Moke's manufacturing, uh, mainly for this building here with that uh, very unique step front. I also believe that the building on the right was also part of the complex. It also has a step front that you, uh, and you saw two in the uh, ad that both had the step front. So I think that was all part of the same complex. The step front was very popular in the buildings uh, in South Park uh, during that era. You can see uh, this one here has uh, five steps before it gets to the center one at the top. And uh, this next one here, you're actually looking at the building from behind. And it has four steps before you get to the center one. And this building here has eight steps, so they varied in the amount of steps, but they had a very similar uh, frontage on a lot of these buildings. And if you're driving down Connor today, these aren't the only buildings you'll see with the step front. 
going closer to town heading toward the river you'll see this. You see this one here that was probably one time the front of a, uh, a manufacturing type uh, building. And then if you look uh, over here to your left as we zoom in here, you'll see another step from building. Uh, this used to be the uh, Little Brothers Foundry, and they were around for decades. I know they were in the 1920s uh, directories. This picture here, though, was taken much later. This was taken in the 60s, uh, and this is the Little Brothers Foundry. And right on the corner of uh, 24th and Connor, there was a freight company owned by Dale Moffat and Myron Ogden, and Ogden and Moffat Company. And here we see one of their trucks. This was an important spinoff from one of the South Park manufacturers. Holmes Foundry needed someone to haul their cylinder block uh, from the foundry to uh, the Hudson plant in Detroit. And so that's where Ogden and Muffet came in. Holmes Foundry was uh, another cornerstone in South Park. They had uh, several plants in Port Jern. The main plant, of course, was in South Park. Uh, they may have actually had two in South Park, I'm not real sure about that, but they did have four altogether. This photograph you've been looking at are some of the foundry workers in one of the Holmes plants. Holmes made cylinder blocks for the Hudson Motor Car Company. Here you can see uh, one of the Hudson cars in that time period. They also made other uh, foundry products for the GM uh, company as well. Here we see a bunch of Chevrolets. In 1916, foundry manager Lou Blunt hired a large number of Hungarian workers. In the 1920s, he brought in scores of Southern Afro-Americans. In the 1930s, he began recruiting Mexican workers. The foundry workers and their families settled in South Park and made it a truly integrated community. Across the St. Clair River, at another homeless foundry, however, ethnic tensions exploded in 1937 when the workers, mainly Poles and Italian, staged a wildcat strike. They demanded wages of $5 a day, 8-hour shifts, showers, and toilets. The company tried to bring in 300 Canadian-born replacement workers, setting off an ugly race riot in which Point Edward and the Sarnia police sided with the strike breakers. Several people suffered serious injuries. And the Canadian Forum magazine predicted the time will come when Sarnia and Ontario and all Canada will remember what happened at Sarnia on March 3, 1937, and be ashamed. By World War I, there were ten factories producing in South Park. At the close of World War I, Henry McMorrin, by then a former congressman, opened the Great Lakes Foundry with the assistance of his son-in-law, Andrew Murphy, and his friend, A.J. Tyson. The foundry, which produced cast iron flywheels for Chevrolet, was the world's largest manufacturer of flywheels by 1929. So, as you've seen in these videos, there were a lot of foundries in South Park. Another large manufacturing concern that uh, South Park Factory Land brought into their folds was the Port Sherm Salt Company. This kind of surprised me because basically South Park quits at uh, Ravenswood, and this is south of that. But in this article and uh, other articles I've read, uh, they show it to be part of Factory Land's uh, acquisitions. Portrain Salt was also on the Portrain map and was also in the Portrain directory, so maybe the boundaries were changed someplace along the line. Also notice in this advertisement that they had the largest salt plant in the state of Michigan, and they sold the best salt, Triangle Salt. Here you can see the salt being loaded up, and in this picture here, you can see the delivery that's being made in Port Jern with the, the horse and wagon. And if you look closely, uh, you can see the Port Jern Salt Company, but you can also see the triangle there, and that was triangle table salt. And in this picture here, you can get a pretty good view of this uh, empty bag, the, a bag very similar to the one you saw in the wagon there. Later on, this company would become the Morton Salt Company, which many of us are familiar with. And this is one of the earliest pictures ever taken uh, in the salt plant. You can see the workers appear to be filling the uh, salt containers that would be uh, for sale retail-wise. 
All right, I think that's enough about manufacturing. Of course, that was one of their main goals in South Park, to bring manufacturing into the, uh, the area. And the other goal, of course, was good housing. But they needed uh, businesses as well. And uh, we can look at a few of those old businesses that we have photographs of uh, right here. We have the Atlantic and Pacific Grocery Store. And for those of you that may not uh, know, before A&P was called A&P Groceries, it was called Atlantic and Pacific. And next door to that, we have the National Cut Rate Store. I'm not sure exactly what they're cutting their rates on. If you've got really good eyes, maybe you can make it out. Uh, a couple of those look like uh, maybe shoes or pants. And I'm not sure about the others. In this photograph here, it says Pooh Hall and Shoe Shop. We also know that there was ice cream available here, too, because you can see the signage for Wilson's Ice Cream out front. And here we can see uh, the signage for the shoe shop. And in this photograph, in front of uh, Craig South Park Market, you can see the employees of the market uh, look like they're promoting tasty bread. We've already looked at this photograph once, but Tomlin Drugstore was a very important part of South Park for decades. And so we'll look at it again. Kitty Corner from the Tomlin Drugstore was the store on the right, which is Ahe's Drugstore, and then the white building was the barber shop. And the building next to that on the left was the interurban uh, station. And of course, in the foreground, you'd have the triangle that we talked about in a previous video. Of course, there was a roller skating rink, and here we have a group of uh, South Park uh, roller skaters. That's what the caption says on this photograph, anyway. And maybe you'll see somebody here you recognize. So what happened to South Park? What happened to that beautiful vision that these three men had? Well, it, uh, it was successful for a while. And probably the residents of South Park can tell you better than I can. But businesses left either through competition or their products were no longer needed, which meant that people moved out. Other people moved in. Quite a few renters moved in, didn't take care of their homes. Neighborhoods deteriorated and crime increased. Russ Sawyer was a photographer. He was born in Fort Huron in 1907. And although he shadowed area photographers and took a photography course in Detroit, Mr. Sawyer was largely self-taught. He served as a contract photographer for the Times Herald for nearly 50 years. He is known for his photos that have documented news-breaking moments in the history of the Blue Water area. Over his lifetime, he amassed a tremendous collection of photographs. And after his death, the Sawyer family donated his negatives to the Portier Museum, uh, a wonderful collection. And many of these I've used in my uh, video series. The photographs you've been looking at are some of the ones he's taken of South Park, and if I had to guess, I would think that you, these were uh, perhaps taken in the 1930s or so. But from these photographs, you can see some of the changes that occurred over the years in South Park. Changes can be bad, but uh, changes can be good as well. If you look at the residential area in South Park today, it's come a long ways from what it used to be back in the 30s. We want to look at a couple other things before we finish this video, and both of those things are churches. And the first one we want to look at is South Park Baptist Church. In this photograph here, it almost uh, appears to be the completion of the building of the church. The church was located on the corner of 28th Street and Nern. Today, that uh, location is occupied by the Shiloh Baptist Church. The second church we want to look at is the Sturgis Church. This is located on Ravenswood. It is now called the Sturgis Memorial Congregational Church. And this little white church on Ravenswood Road turns 150 years old this summer. The church started with the Pioneer Sunday School class in 1865 as the nation was emerging from the Civil War. This would have been across the street from its present location. The church was given the land upon which it was built by the Sturgis family, who were also founders of the church. Carolyn and Barlow Sturgis came here from Vermilion, Ohio, where the family had been deeded land through the Western Reserve from Fairfield, Connecticut after the Revolutionary War. 
They then came through the Port Huron area and bought 248 acres of land in a share sale in 1847. The Sturgis owned property from the St. Clair River north to Moak Street, west to Michigan Road, and south to Ravenswood. South Park, or I should say Lincoln Park, was Sturgis's cow pasture. They operated a shingle mill on the river, and Carolyn's brothers, the Manuel brothers, operated a sawmill near where Prestolite used to be. The land was gradually sold off to factories and the railroad. Kathy Swainson, who was a descendant of the Sturgis, was kind enough to share this information with me. She still lives in the home that her grandfather built for her parents on Sturgis Street, along with five other households of Sturgis descendants who still live in the original family plat. Well, this is about as far south as I can go and still stay in the Port Huron city limits. There is a story I want to share with you for, that involves the South Park area. A story that really warrants its own video, which will be our next video. That was the amazing escape of John Dillinger and a cellmate by the name of Herbert Youngblood from an Indiana jail. Youngblood's life ended in a shootout in South Park.